Hey everybody, Nick here. Um, and so this is going to be the Machiavelli video. And uh, I just wanted to, so we're going to talk about the qualities of the prince. And uh, so first off, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the historical context of this. And also, I'm going to direct you to another video, another YouTube video, which is on a little bit of an unusual subject, but I think actually is a nice video that complements this reading in some ways. Um, and that's a video by a guy named Matt Coville. I'm going to put a, I'll, put, I'll actually post it for you guys so you guys can actually have it there on the canvas page. Um, it's by Matt Coville, who's a game designer. And uh, he uh, mostly does video games and he also does tabletop art role playing games and things like that. But he has a video on the tabletop board game called Diplomacy. And that video is about the game Diplomacy, but it is also about what Machiavelli is talking about here which is a certain kind of politics, what we call power politics. And that's the kind of, uh, that that's what that video is about. And so it's a nice supplement, I think, to this reading um, because it sort of gives you a really strong idea of really what power politics is and why it kind of exists. Um, both in the context of this, this kind of board game that exists uh, called Diplomacy uh, and then also how it informs the real world in various ways. And I think it's a, the video does a good job of sort of explaining that. Um, so I'd like you to watch that. Uh, so secondly, um, then um, I'm going to now just spend a few minutes talking about the, the context, the historical context in which this, this reading sort of exists. So first of all, we might think about Italy at the time Machiavelli was alive, right, which is in the um, late 1400s, early 1500s. So basically during the, the period of time uh, that we call the Renaissance. And um, uh, he wrote his book, The Prince, which was published in 1513. And uh, The Prince was this book that was uh, basically his advice to rulers of the day, right? Uh, about how to uh, be a good ruler, um, how to stay in power, how to be a good ruler, how to and it was advice on how to do this right um it's this it's not super long but it's all it's a book um and what had happened was is that uh machiavelli had been in power um in florence uh the city of florence in italy uh when the the family known as the the medicis the medicis had been out of power in florence for a while and what happened is they came back into power and when they did that, Machiavelli was kind of ousted because he was he was in power uh, with the group of people who were in power while they weren't there. Uh, and so when they came back, they wanted to get rid of all of the people who'd been there before, who were probably their enemies. Uh, and so they ousted Machiavelli. He was um, uh, not not like thrown in prison or anything like that, but he was uh, exiled sort of from from sort of. Uh, Florentine society and sort of uh, pushed to the wayside. He basically lived kind of uh, uh, under like house arrest kind of thing in his like, you know, kind of uh, countryside estate or whatever, I think. Uh, and then he just wrote this book uh, as a way of kind of staying in the game in a strange way. Uh, by the game, I mean the game of politics, right? So he wanted to still be influential in terms of politics. So he thought, well, I'll write this book about politics and everybody will read it and because they'll want to know what I have to say about politics. And when they read it, then I will therefore influence people and therefore I will be an influence on the political rulers, potentially also because he, he might have been hoping that the Medici rulers would read his book, right? And that they would then be influenced in their decision making by what he his advice here. So he thought that that by writing this book he could still be an influence on what was going on in Florentine politics. Um, so I think that's an interesting uh, um, uh, aspect of this. Um, so that's that's kind of the context. That's why he writes the book. Machiavelli had been a political advisor. But um, the other thing to remember is what was Italy like basically at this time? Um, Italy was basically a collection of city-states. Um, it didn't become a modern nation really until the 19th century under a guy named Count Cavour and this uh, kind of mercenary guy named Garibaldi um, sort, of, sort of pulled together uh, the modern-day Italy. Um, and uh, so... Um, 
that that's basically what happens. But um, prior to that, during this period of time period, it was uh, it was basically a collection of uh, city states. Um, so uh, which was partly because of the Vatican. The Vatican did not want a big powerful kingdom around surrounding it. So they thought it would be better if there were these little like you know uh, city states and baronies and little little principalities that existed that were probably always kind of in war and conflict with each other. And it was useful for the Vatican to have that happening because they didn't want to have what they were afraid of was that like that a powerful king, if there had been a, a king of Italy, uh, if the king had just kind of would then invade Rome, right, could take over Rome and then could install the, you know, could just take the Pope out of power and put in their own Pope. You know, and so that was what I think that the, the, the church was afraid of. And so they, they definitely tried to um, control the politics in Italy as much as possible, mostly by, by sort of creating the situation where nobody was really in charge in Italy. So, um, but there was always a possibility that like a, a powerful king might invade Italy and then do something like that. So that was something they did worry about, um, particularly the king of France, right? You know, um, uh, you know, and for a while there was like tensions with, uh, Rome and whatnot over, you know, control of these kind of things. There were actually a period of time where there were two popes, uh, where you had, to, you know, competing popes, one in France and one in Rome, I believe. So, but anyway, um, but this is, this is the time period that's going on. So there's all this kind of internecine kind of politicking going on. Um, there's also, um, this is a time period where soldiers have stopped doing the thing they were doing in the Middle Ages, where they owed service to a feudal lord for a certain number of days. So like it was 60 days, I think. So you owed service to your Lord for a certain number of days a year. Um, and uh, that was kind of had the reciprocal relationship. You, they offered you sort of protection and you offered them support um, by offering your soldiers and men to go fight for them in the causes and wars that they wanted to pursue. So that's how you supported a king. Like the king was supported by his noblemen, right? Um, but what had happened by the 14-1500s, that had evolved, uh, and now soldiers were mostly doing this mostly for pay. So you had to pay these guys money, and it was, uh, it was, they would fight for you however long they, you know, you could continue to pay them, right? Um, and so that changed things, and it gave rise in Italy to a group of guys who are known as the Condottieri, who were kind of like uh, uh, knights, right? But they were knights who were for sort of for hire, right? Um, uh, so they, they just wanted to get paid, right? And so they were mercenaries. Um, and so most of these cities employed like uh, companies of these guys, you know, uh, had them in their employ. Um, and so that's, that was, so it's this sort of internecine sort of uh, kind of politicking thing. If you ever watched, you know, the kind of uh, sort of politics you get in, shows like Game of Thrones or the Borgias, right? Like that's the kind of politics that that Machiavelli is is kind of talking about here, right? Um, uh, you know, also informed by a lot of, uh, you know, things going on in, in uh, certainly uh, Italy in the, um, during the period of the Roman Empire, which was of course centuries before this, but uh, um, uh, that, that the shadow of the Roman Empire still sort of impinges on things. And certainly Machiavelli is very familiar with the writings of uh, Roman politicians, uh, Roman uh, soldiers, emperors, uh, and the literature of Rome and Greece as well. So like th that's something that, that he's very familiar with the classical kind of literature. Um, that's something that basically happened during the Renaissance. A lot of that stuff was rediscovered basically. Okay, so, uh, so that's Machiavelli kind of uh, and his sort of historical context a little bit. Um, again, um, more about the polit power politics stuff you'll get in the Matt Coville video, which I'll post um, so uh, as well. So as a as a companion piece to this video, so that video is about twenty minutes, just so you know. Um, this one should be I'm not exactly sure how long, but uh, um, it shouldn't be too long, hopefully. Um, okay, so I'm going to spend here talking a little bit of time about the qualities of the prince. Right, and uh, um, just to kind of m mention a few things that I think are important, go sort of going through this, and things that Machiavelli sort of touches on here. Um, so, in, as we can see, this is this is also a bit of a contrast to the Lao Tzu piece, right? Which I'll maybe talk about the that at the end when we when I get to the ending. 
But uh, let's just talk about Machiavelli and kind of what his thing. So, um, by the way, he uses the word prince, right? But we have to understand that that term, he means the ruler, right, um, of the nation by when he says prince. Um, that comes from a very particular thing. Um, uh, basically, the word prince comes from the word princeps, which is a, a Latin term, uh, which comes from the Roman Empire. Um, and that was a term that uh, Augustus Caesar took for himself. Uh, he was described himself as the princeps of Rome, uh, which sometimes translates as the first citizen. Um, so I'm the first citizen of Rome uh, because he didn't want to declare himself emperor. He was still the ruler, but he said, no, 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 I'm just simply the first citizen of the state. I am the princeps. Um, but he was effectively the, the ruler. Um, but later that term was sort of taken and utilized, utilized sometimes to mean the ruler. So, uh, and then became the term prince, right, as a result of that. Later, it was then applied to the son of the king. So the king is the ruler, um, you know, uh, and then the, his heir, right, you know, is the prince or princess, right, who's going to inherit, right? You know, so you have a king or queen and then you have a prince or princess who's going to inherit the, the throne. But that, that ha happened as European monarchy kind of evolved. But the way Machiavelli is using the term here, he just means the ruler. The prince is the ruler of the nation, okay? Just so you're aware. Um, and it's a, a reference back to that kind of old Augustus way of sort of thinking about that. So um, anyway, um, one of the things that's interesting is that, that he first mentions here, that he says that, hey, like, here's some advice for you as a ruler, right? Um, uh, one of the things he says that's really important is, is that you should be armed, right? That as a ruler, uh, and this is something if we think about our politicians today and then we, 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 how we imagine them, that's not something that we generally imagine that, you know, like Joe Biden or, or you know, Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or walk around with like a gun, you know, visible <laughs> on them or right, you know, whatnot. You do see that still sometimes in like um, uh, some countries where you have like military dictators and things like that, where you see them in uniform and also uh, um, armed. Right. And they're they're sort of definitely harkening back to this older way of doing things. Uh, in the sense of, uh, like, uh, I'm going to show you that my power rests in the military, right? But what's interesting is Machiavelli points out there's a couple of practical reasons why you would want to be armed as a, as a, as a, as a ruler, right? And make, make, make it known that you're, you're armed at all times. Uh, so you walk around with your, at this time it would have been a sword, right? You would have had a sword at your side, right? And he, he, he kind of is suggesting that that shouldn't just be a ceremonial thing. It's not just like for show. It is partly for show because you want to do sort of symbolically demonstrate, yes, this is where my power is. My power comes from the military, or at least part of my power is based in the military. But the other thing is, is that you want to be able to use the sword, actually, right? It's to defend yourself. Because he's basically saying that you should be careful around who you have around you and you should be armed at all times because you don't know what's going to happen, right? If somebody turns in, like there's assassins there who are going to try to kill you, right? Um, you want to be armed so that you could maybe fight them off, right? So they know it's not just going to be easy to kill you. You're always going to have a weapon, right? So that's one reason he says you should be armed, Right, uh, so which is kind of interesting, um, uh, and uh, um, so uh, okay. Um, yeah, and he says uh, so. For between an armed and an unarmed man, there is no comparison whatsoever, and it is not reasonable for an armed man to an obey. An unarmed man willingly, nor that an unarmed man should be safe amongst armed servants. So, like, if your guards are all armed, but you're not, are you really safe, right? What if they've paid, somebody, one of your enemies has paid off your guards to do something to you, right? You know, that kind of thing. Or what if your guards just hate you? <laughs> like, that happened in ancient Rome. Uh, um, he's probably thinking about people like Caligula. Caligula was my cat is is clawing at the door um so that's what you're hearing so sorry about that um I may have to let him in but uh, we'll see 
Um, anyway, um, so uh, he's thinking about people like Caligula, who was assassinated by his own guards. Hang on, I'm gonna go let my cat out. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> yes, here's Marshall. Say hello. Hi, Marshall. Yes. That's my cat. So he's just chilling out here now with me. So sorry about that. Um, uh, so Caligula was assassinated by his guards. And uh, um, uh, that, um, yeah. So like that's exactly what Machiavelli is thinking about, that you, you have to be careful, right? Um, because if you're despised, especially if you're a despised ruler, um, you can't trust people because if they hate you, they're going to be turning on you. Right. Um, and so he says you should not be despised. Right. You know, despised is the absolute worst thing you could be because it, it basically means you have no protection. Right. Um, he does say it is good to be feared, though. So it's OK to be feared, just not despised. Right. And those are two very different things. Um, <laughs> my cat is attacking my pen now. So, um, all right, Marshall, I'm going to put that over there. So, hey, sweet boy. He's probably going to not, I'm, anyway, he's like lurking right here. Okay. Um, so, uh, the other thing he says that's important is, is that, um, uh, thinking that you should think about wartime, uh, even when you're at peace, right? So even in times of, uh, peace, you should still um, uh, be uh, thinking about um, war. So, in fact, you should become very familiar with the uh, geographical landscape uh, that your nation occupies. You should become aware of areas where, you know, how, what kind of lands and things would, would troops have to move through, right, in the landscape. Um, uh, and that you should also read history, right? You should be reading the histories of, um, you know, the times. So you should be reading uh, about battles that were fought. You should be, be familiar with military history, especially in the military history of your region, right? But also maybe the military histories of just in general. So he's thinking particularly about, like, of Rome, right, and Greece, right? The great military battles of the past. And you should think about, like, those rulers, why they made the decisions they did, and you should you need to become a, a lifelong student, effectively, of war, basically. Uh, and that even in peacetime, you should be thinking about war. Um, that, that that is what you do. Um, uh, and so this is interesting. He, he's basically encouraging a kind of... Um, uh, you should have a deep knowledge of this stuff. And that this is part of being a ruler, right? Um, it's interesting. I don't know that that's an aspect today if we think about politicians today that that may not really be an aspect of of modern politics that people tend to think about which is like you know military history but that might be because of just so because this is something we can talk about is how different our politics are and because the way our politics are arranged are, are arranged so differently than the politics of machiavelli's day because machiavelli's time the politics was pretty direct and brutal um, now we don't, there's a lot of, um, like violence, for example, and military action, while they still happen, um, they happen a lot more rarely. Um, and, uh, um, there's a lot more distaste for violence. I think society in general has become, uh, less overtly violent. Um, violence is not a part of of people's lives in the way that it just was in the past. Um, you know, we don't have like public executions, for example, anymore, right? Um, we've moved violence out of the public sphere. Um, violence has become anathema, largely, in our societies. And that's, but it was not at this time. Uh, um, and so uh, I think that this is he's saying, like, look, this is a violent world and you have to become a student of war, right? Um, and you have to be willing to enact violence, right? And even, like, that goes along with the idea of being armed, right? So, um, 
but a lot of this comes with the idea of just being adaptable too that like things are not going to be the same it might be peaceful now but next year it might not be or in two years or five years or however long you're going to be in power like your allies and enemies and situations may change and you suddenly may find yourself from being a peaceful situation to being in a very dangerous violent war situation where and that you have to be adaptable so you have to be able to deal with the changing circumstances of your country's situation and your own rule right um and so part of that comes with the study and understanding of um uh, the past right you know and understanding how the past things have changed from being the past to being how they are t today okay um uh interestingly enough he also says that um you know we think that oh would it be would he recommend you to be a generous you know kind of ruler and whatnot and he says not really no no don't be generous to people uh it's better to be miserly he says um so let me read some of the, what he says here. He says, And so if a prince wants to maintain his reputation for generosity amongst men, it is necessary for him to not to neglect any possible means of lavish display. In so doing, such a prince will always use up all his resources, and he will be obliged, eventually, if he wishes to maintain his reputation for generosity, to burden the people with excessive taxes and to do everything possible to raise funds. So he says, if you become too generous, then you're going to run out of money. Uh, and you're also going to run out of money for when you really need it too. Uh, and eventually you're gonna need to, to uh, raise taxes because uh, you're gonna need the money for something and you're gonna be like, okay, we have to do this. So now I have to raise taxes because I've spent all the money being generous to everybody else. Um, and so that's something that uh, is interesting what he says. Um, uh, it makes me think about um, uh, um, the tv show the wire if you guys ever watched that show the guy who's there it's in one of the early seasons the guy who's the mayor um uh he makes all these promises about what he's gonna do uh this like this like uh redevelopment project and it's it's uh the city redevelopment and he's got this big sort of visionary plan to sort of help the city and everything like that and he wants to come in and make this happen and that was like his core campaign message and um when he comes into power when he comes into office he wins the election comes into office and within just weeks he finds out that um the school district has like a 10 million dollar budget shortfall uh which he was completely unaware of and uh so it scuttles right away scuttles his plans for the redevelopment project because now he has to deal with the school district because now suddenly it's like triage and the you know budget is bleeding and like and he, he can't do the things he promised. Um, this goes along with what Machiavelli says later. He says, um, don't be afraid to break your promises. He says, basically, promise what you have to and then feel free to break them, right? But also, this comes along with his sense of fiscal uh, thing, which is his uh, fiscal sensibility, which is basically, um, don't spend money if you don't have to. Uh, don't give money to people who are just you know uh to, to just get people to like you you know like oh one way to win popularity really well is you can just give money away to people um uh to be generous to people but he says that maybe it's better uh that if you hung on to the money so that if you had an emergency you would have the money available right um so that's something that i think um is, is something to think about um uh, okay, but um, so so those are those are things he 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 definitely notes right. Um, okay, uh, so it's we see a certain direction in his sort of thinking here. Um, he sort of always tends to land on a certain side of things. Um, uh, better to be uh, well, it's it's better to be loved than despised, right? It's better to be feared than loved, even, right? Um, that that's how he feels, uh, um, because if people are afraid of you, they're gonna be always afraid to move against you. Whereas being loved is something that's more fleeting, I think, in his mind, right? Um, that uh, and that that that's not gonna necessarily 
Because that then if things change, circumstances change beyond your control, they suddenly may not love you anymore. So if they don't love you anymore, do they despise you? And are they going to turn against you? Right? And if they turn against you, what are they going to do? But if they are afraid of you, if they if you're the ruler and they fear you, then maybe they won't act against you, right? So that is that is one thing he's sort of saying here that that's why it's better to be feared, right? Um, right. So that's the one of the next sections here is on cruelty and mercy and whether it is better to be loved than to be feared or to, or the contrary. Right. You know, um, and this is what he says about uh, Cesare Borgia, who is uh, a prominent uh, um, uh, kind of, you know, leader of the day uh, in Italy. Uh, so this is what he says. And it was noted for doing all kinds of underhanded uh, stuff. Right. Uh, and being brutal even when he had to. So this is Cesare Borgia. Cesare Borgia was considered cruel. Nonetheless, his cruelty had brought order to Ramagna, um, united it, restored it to peace and obedience. We examine this carefully. We, uh, if we examine this carefully, we shall see that he was more merciful than the Florentine people, who, in order to, uh, to avoid being considered cruel, allowed the destruction of uh, uh, Pistoia. Um, therefore, a prince must not worry about the reproach of cruelty when it is a matter of keeping his subjects united and loyal. So it's better for people to maybe think that you're cruel if you keep everything together. If you're holding everything together, then that's better. This gets to the kind of essential morality that underlies Machiavelli's ideas, right? Um, the essential I morality that underlies his ideas um, has to do not with an interest in keeping your word, not an interest in, in being kind uh, or to be thought of as being kind. It's, it's none of that thing. None of those things are things that he uh, considers to be valuable. Um, really, the, the morality that underlies this, and because you could definitely look at this and see as this as being a window to immorality, to being a window to tyranny, to being a window to brutality, right? Um, this, this is maybe where we could say that this is, this is leading us down a pretty, pretty, into a pretty ugly picture of politics, right? Um, but I think we have to keep in mind that at the, at the root of this, th there's something very particular going on with, 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 uh, Machiavelli's morality, which is that for him, right? And you don't, we certainly don't have to agree with this, Right. But we, I think it's useful to understand that for him, um, maintaining order, maintaining the state, maintaining a, a ruler who's effective is more important than any of these other things, right? Things that we might consider to be important, right? Um, but for him, it's, it's the threat of chaos is far more dangerous than any sort of accusations of cruelty or, or um, uh, duplicity or um, uh, untruthfulness on the part of the ruler. Um, so at the end of the day, for him, it, it has to do with that, that it's maintained. The most important thing is to maintain your power because if you don't have your power... Uh, sorry, guys. I'm like knocking things over now. So, <laughs> so I apologize for all the nonsense going on in this video. Um, but, uh, um, anyway, uh, so I'm just doing what I can. So, um, okay. So I think that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. Um, there's a few other things he mentions that I think are worth, worth talking about, um, but but that that's kind of I think underlying this that that point about his morality and about where that's coming from, um, and, and there's maybe one other aspect of that we could, we could mention, which is that that I think that this informs a little bit um, his feelings about people, right? That Machiavelli's feelings about people are very particular. Like he has a very particular view of human nature, right? Um, 
and uh, so uh, and and basically, it's it's the opposite view of what Lao Tzu has, uh, which is that Machiavelli seems to feel that people are terrible. Basically, uh, you can't trust them, and uh, they're going to stab you in the back the first chance they get. Um, and uh, that that is at the root of a lot of what he's talking about here. That um, his uh, belief in uh, human nature and in the problems of human nature, um, I think, are a big part of um, what, what, what's going on here uh, and why he, he presents things the way he does uh, and the way he, the way he views the world, right? has a lot to do with just his um, maybe unflattering view of human beings. He thinks we're, we're kind of terrible, right, as a, as a group of people. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, that's, that's, that's important, I think, uh, to sort of understand here. Um, let's see. Um, there's a quote here, um, and he says that, that basically saying that you as the arbiter, let's see, um, the prince is where there is no impartial arbiter, one must consider the final result. Um, and so he's saying that there's no really person who is the arbiter of the actions of rulers, right? You know, there's nobody who's like sets above them to sort of judge their activities. Now, interestingly enough, today there kind of is because we do have things like the world court and things like that, where like, you know, if you do really terrible things like you can be brought up on charges, right? You know, um, so there are sometimes that does happen. There are rulers who've been you know, um, uh, so awful, right, that they have, uh, and, you know, that they have uh, not only necessarily been ousted, but they've been brought up on charges by by uh, other nations for, for human rights violations, right? Human rights was not really a thing at the time Machiavelli was writing this. Now, it's interesting to think that if Machiavelli was alive today, I think he might hold a lot of our he would, he would have adapted to our time and certainly said that you as the ruler have to adapt to the times and that would mean also maybe changing a lot of some of his, his, his things about this. I think there'd be certain things he'd say, no, 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 that, like, that he wouldn't change on. Um, like, I think basically the other thing is, uh, is that for you to be effective, remember, is you have to stay in power. And so whatever you have to do to stay in power for him, that's the key. Uh, and so, and then you can sort of uh, go forward from there. Um, the question is, is, this is always a struggle in politics, which is that how much of your own uh, morality, how much of your own beliefs are potentially going to be tested and how many and are you going to have to give up some of those things in order to get things done? Um, and that's, that's always a tension, right? Um, and so uh, what Machiavelli is saying here is, is that you have to Think about the final result, he says, right? The final result. And so, the, like, where is this going? Like, what is the outcome, right? Um, some people have, as it's notes in our textbook here, that line has sometimes been mistranslated as the end justifies the means. But that isn't what Machiavelli is saying, right? He is saying, though, you do have to weigh the final result, right? Is the final result going to be a good result, right? You know, I do think that he ultimately wants a ruler to enact a situation where society, where, where people benefit from the rule of the ruler, right? He's not interested in forwarding, I think, uh, um, just tyranny or brutality or cruelty, but he's saying that those things are tools that like a ruler might have to use, right? Um, in a world that is less than perfect, shall we say. Um, so, uh, and again, we might criticize those things as justifications, right? Um, but again, this is, like I said, a very different world that he's talking to than the world we live in today, a world that has moved away from a lot of this kind of thing. We certainly still have violence, and we certainly are capable of maybe enacting even more terrifying violence, which is also one reason why, like, you know, they didn't have nuclear weapons at the time that Machiavelli was writing this, Um the costs of violence for the modern world are so much greater, maybe. And so that's one reason maybe violence has become less acceptable is because the actual costs of violence. We, 
I mean, the kind of violence we can enact on each other because of our technology is so much more um, intense than the kind of violence that they were able to even even enact, even though that, that violence has its own kind of terribleness, you know. Um, uh, but, but there's a different kind of terribleness to, you know, just sitting alone in a room and pressing a button, you know, to destroy your enemies than sending, you know, armies of, you know, armed soldiers with spears and swords out to, to kill each other, you know. Um, uh, either way, it's bad, but uh, it's, um, you know, uh, it's a different kind of situation. So um, anyway, but uh, um, so I did want to touch on just Lao Tzu in him a little bit just for a few minutes here. Um, we can see basically that 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 Machiavelli has a very uh, different attitude about people, his different attitude about the role of the ruler, about what you should be doing, and how you should present yourself in society. Um, Lao Tzu has a remember a very hands off kind of view. The ruler should be invisible, should be somebody who um, uh, that the people aren't really even aware of. Ideally, um, the the, the, basically the ruler who is best is the ruler who governs least you know who uh, does the least things um, and he doesn't say though that you shouldn't remember uh, so you shouldn't just maybe go to war or things like that but what he says is that if you have to do those things then you've kind of already lost um, there's a much more intensive sense of compassion a much more intensive sense of morality a much more intensive sense of uh, the evil of violence in Latsu's work than we see certainly here in Machiavelli. Um, there is a kind of morality in Machiavelli, but again, it's 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 about maintaining order in order to ensure a kind of um, uh, uh, the maximum public good. That's I think what he sees as the justification for his um, advice. Um, whereas Machiavelli, I, I mean, uh, whereas Latsu, I think has, a, has a, again a very different view of this kind of thing. Um, uh, so, um, anyway, but I, I think that, that are, are two very different and two different, very interesting sort of viewpoints about politics. One that is much more in line with our Western kind of way of doing things. Like today, we definitely still pay a lot of attention to the military. We, um, uh, operate in this kind of very intense diplomatic world. We don't have a kind of, um, uh, the kind of uh, attitude that Lao Tzu does, where we wanna, we don't tend to anyway, uh, where we're sort of um, try to remove ourselves from the machinery of um, of things, and and we wanna sort of have a kind of stillness, right, where we where we kind of operate, sort of uh, um, uh, sort of so we can observe and and uh, um, but not affect things. Uh, and Machiavelli has a situation where he's very much, you know, advocating a kind of direct involvement and uh, whatnot, something very different than what Lao Tzu is saying. Um, anyway, so we can we can continue to talk about that. Maybe um, that's something I'll, I'll post as a kind of a discussion question. Um, but anyway, if you guys have any other questions, certainly ask those in the discussion area. I'll be posting those soon. I'm not sure exactly when I'll post those, but uh, in the next day or so. Um, but you should watch this video and then watch the Matt Colville video for now. And uh, um, then we'll go from there. So, and then uh, just respond in the discussion section. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks guys. I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, again, if there's other things you guys have, or maybe if anything else occurs to me, um, I'll let you know. Okay. All right. And so uh, there'll be another video uh, getting posted soon about your upcoming assignments and uh, the uh, schedule. Okay? All right. Okay. Thanks, guys.